shaping up to be a somber Sunday morning for the followers of Jesus. But on the way to the tomb, they heard three words that would lift their spirits and change the course of history forever. Today on a special edition of Truth For Life, Alistair Begg will celebrate the amazing truth of Easter morning. He has risen. Mark 16 and verse 1, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Amen. Well, it goes without saying, I think, that the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is at the very core of the Christian faith. It's not an addendum. It's not extraneous in any way. And whenever people discover that Jesus is alive, then their lives have to reckon with that. Saul of Tarsus, as a religious Jew, was totally convinced that Jesus was dead that the gospel story was a fraud, and that the people who were the followers of Jesus deserved nothing better than to be either imprisoned or killed. And then, dramatically, one day he was literally floored to discover that he was wrong and that Jesus was alive. As a result, he became a preacher of the good news that he had previously rejected. And he became uh, just wonderful at providing a very brief statement of the essentials of Christian faith. On one occasion, as he writes to the Corinthian church, he puts it in this way, I deliver to you what was of primary and of first importance, and then this is what he says, that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he was raised, and he appeared. And as he goes on through that particular part of his letter, he is very straightforward about how essential the resurrection is. So what I'd like to do is to examine this this morning very, very simply, to take the approach of the three R's. And the three R's this morning are, first of all, to look at the record, then to say something concerning its relevance, and then finally something regarding our response to it. So first of all, then, to look at the record. Now, there are a number of records, aren't there? A uh, number of places throughout the New Testament where the story of the resurrection of Jesus is recorded for us. And I want us just to look at the core facts as they're given us here by Mark. You'll notice that Mark is telling us that these women had made a purchase. They had purchased spices, and the reason they did so is because they had a plan. Now, their plan was to go to the tomb. It's very important for us to recognize that they had not bought uh, flowers in order to go and rejoice in the reality of the resurrection, but they had purchased spices instead so that they could make sure that they could anoint the body of Jesus. There was absolutely no doubt about the fact that Jesus was dead. And in one of the Gospels, uh, the angelic uh, announcer says to them, "'Why do you seek the living among the dead?' And their answer, of course, would have been, we're not here to find the living. We're here to look for the dead among the dead. Jesus is dead. We all know that. Why do you think we brought these spices with us? But you know, when you think about the spices, they're a little late, aren't they? After all, the immediacy of decay of a body, uh, combined with the fact that um, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had already uh, purchased 75 pounds, we're told, of myrrh and aloe, and will have made at least an attempt to embalm the body of Jesus. 
Uh, why in the world would it be of relevance that they would show up now? Well, don't let's be too hard on the ladies. We should be hard on the men. They never even showed up at all. The fact that they may have shown up late and to do something that was largely uh, immaterial is an indication of their love. It's an indication of their devotion. It's an indication of the fact that when you get caught up with something, when you get caught up with someone, it may cause you to do things that you never anticipated doing. It's so overwhelmed, are they, by the prospect that they, that they don't pay attention to the one big problem they're going to have. And it's only as they're making their way towards the tomb that they said to one another, we've got a major problem because there's that big stone that they rolled over there, and clearly we're not going to be able to remove it. Well, they didn't need to worry about that because you will see that in verse uh, 5, is it, uh, they get there and they discover that uh, the stone has been rolled back. Actually, verse 4. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Now, some people are tempted to read these gospel records and say, you know, this is just legend. But in actual fact, what we discover is that the way this is recorded, it doesn't read like a legend at all. And the way in which there are variations between all the gospels make us feel, make us think, make us deduce that actually what we're dealing with are, are eyewitness reports. And especially when we recognize the fact that in first century um, uh, Palestine, it wasn't possible for a woman to give testimony in, in a court of law. So when you look at this and you read about the stone being rolled away, you read about the presence of the angelic visitor— don't stumble over it immediately. Authentic Christianity is full of difficult parts. It is full of that which makes us say, wait a minute. It is full of that which demands an explanation which cannot be given on a normal, natural human plane. And a Christianity without the difficult parts isn't even Christianity. So, don't be overwhelmed. Don't be unsettled by the fact that there is a man sitting in there, a young man, an angelic man, and described as an angel in the other gospel records. Mark is describing an angelic visit in human terminology, a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe. And when they saw him, they said, "'Oh, hey, Christ is risen.' And he said, "'He's risen indeed.' No, he didn't. No, he didn't. They didn't. No. And when they saw him, they were alarmed. And he said, Christ is risen. No, he didn't. He said, do not be alarmed. You're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Now, he says, he has risen. He's not here. And if you look over there, you'll see the place where he was laid. Now, when you combine this with the other gospel records that tell us that the grave clothes of Jesus were left intact so that his departure from the shroud was not, if you like, a natural departure. He didn't leave the grave clothes the way some of the teenagers have left their bedroom this morning in absolute disarray, waiting for a return visit. No, the pristine nature of the grave clothes was such as to cause people to say, that's not normal. That's not normal. Of course it wasn't normal. That's not natural. Of course it wasn't natural. You expect the creator of the universe to do something other than this? When he triumphs over sin and death? So, their alarm gives way to an assignment. They are to go out and tell the disciples, and Peter gets a special mention because, of course, Peter had made a royal hash of things. Go and tell them that Jesus is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. That takes you back to chapter 14 and verse 28, where Jesus has told them, this is what is going to happen to me, but I will meet you again in Galilee. And so out they go. Verse 8 tells us, And they went out, this is the end of the record from Mark, and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone. They were absolutely dumbstruck. 
Presumably, as they made their way through the narrow Jerusalem streets, they just weren't even talking to each other. A silence that was clearly temporary. If it hadn't been temporary, then Mark would have no story to tell. Well, we'll leave the record there. You can consider it on your own. Is it relevant? That's our second R. The record you can consider. The relevance, uh, think with me for a moment. After all, someone will legitimately say, this happened a long time ago. This is over 2,000 years since this happened. Why all this song and dance by Christians? Sort of interesting if you're a religious sort, but just irrelevant. No, it isn't. Think about it. Here's the one eventuality that all of us face. Death. The one event over which we have absolutely no control. The one thing that is absolutely guaranteed. From the minute we breathe, there is an absolute guarantee one day we will stop breathing. That, that, that is a paralyzing fear to many. It is a lurking thought to most. And every one of us ought to be saying, has anybody ever actually conquered death? And if they did, have they made a way for me to conquer it? And we open up the pages of the Bible, and here is the very heart of the Christian story, that Jesus Christ has conquered death. Death exists because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God. That is why the good has become bad. Jesus has entered into time in order that our brokenness and our messed upness might find all the necessary repair in him. And that because he is resurrected, he will one day return— Therefore, we ought not to feel that history is just trundling along to nowhere. No, I suggest to you that it is wonderfully relevant. Many of us have been stymied, if we're still in unbelief, because we're looking for rock-solid proofs. I read the Bible, and I couldn't find any proofs. You're not going to find proofs. If you could prove God, it wouldn't be God you proved. If we could frame God and contain God, it wouldn't be God. No, what we have in the Bible are signs. What we have in our humanity are signs. So that the beauty of a morning stirs a longing within us that cannot be fully encapsulated by the most beautiful thing that we've ever imagined. The transcendent nature of a sunset stirs within us a longing for something. The joy of human relationships— that we so easily mess up and feel bad about, create within us a longing for an ultimate relationship. And so it goes on. The longing for justice in our world, so that the children in the playground, you hear them saying, that's not fair. Where did fairness come from? Because within them, they recognize that there is right and there is wrong. And the longing in our world today for things to be put right. Those are all signposts. Have you stopped at the signposts? Because it helps me when I ask myself the question, do I matter? Do I matter? I say, well, I matter to my wife, my children. I matter to a few folks. No, but we all understand that. But do I really matter? (laughs) Does it matter? Is there any meaning? What's the point of all this stuff? Solomon, who was a really brainy guy and wrote Proverbs, at one point in Proverbs, he gives an exhortation to the reader. He says, Go to the ant and consider his ways and be wise. So yesterday I said, You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to Google ants. I will Google ants. I'll see what I can find out about ants, which I did. And I found out that there are people who are completely fascinated by ants, and there is an amazing fascination amongst the fascinated with what is referred to as the ant death spiral. But what these PhD geniuses have discovered is that there is a particular kind of army ant that leads all of its other ants around in its wake. He sets off, and the ants begin to follow it. He leads them in a circle— And these create what are referred to as circular ant mills, not ant hills. One of the largest that has been discovered measured 1,200 feet in circumference, 
And some PhD candidate discovered that this, this uh, circular mill had a two-and-a-half-hour circuit time per ant. But what they discovered is that this, this actually persisted for two, two entire days with ever-increasing numbers of dead bodies resulting from starvation and from exhaustion. So go to the end and be wise. If you're going to follow somebody, you better make sure they know where they're going. If you're going to follow somebody because you think they're going to take you to food, they better not be lying. If you're going to follow somebody, you better determine what the destination is. For surely we wouldn't want just to hook in behind the guy in front of us and go to nowhere. Now, you don't have to go to the New York subway. Just consider your lives. Consider 8 o'clock tomorrow morning on 480 West, 77 North, and all the people following along. We got up to go out to work, to get money, to buy food, to go home, to get up, to go to work, to get money, to buy food, to go home. And Jesus gives meaning to all of these things. You see, the answer to the question, do I matter, is found in the love of God for us. The answer is, sure you matter. He made you, he made you, and he made you for a relationship with him. Is there any purpose in what I'm doing? Sure there is. Listen to what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet he will live. What a claim that is. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In other words, the reality of physical death will be experienced by all. But all who have been placed into Christ and who are raised with Christ, for them death will be like falling asleep this afternoon after a nice Sunday lunch and waking up and saying, Whoa, the sun's come out. Because Jesus has made of death a narrow sunlit strip between the goodbyes of yesterday and the hellos of tomorrow. And my friends, I don't know anyone else who has. Do you? Well, people say, that's just too much for me to swallow. You know, I, I, I'm pretty, I'll, I'll take my chances. And frankly, if, if there's nothing that can be done about it, we might as well get out now while the going's good. And that's exactly what many clever people have done, isn't it? Uh, those of you who take the Wall Street will have seen, as I saw, uh, this amazing piece under the heading, The Escape Artist, the story of Mike Kelly, wonderful contemporary artist, um, very influential, born in Wayne, Michigan, 1954, and in the dying embers of his day, which nobody knew were the dying embers of his day, although he had resolved certain things. This is what he said, I've given my whole life to being an artist, every ounce, so that there's nothing left. But he told his friend, now I need something else, but I'm emptied out. Now I need something else, but I'm emptied out. We are by nature emptied out. So we go for what helps us. Significance, cash, sex, whatever. Just to try and make us through that getting up, going to work, coming home, getting up. Well, I could say more about its relevance, but I don't want to become irrelevant. So let me come to my final point. Response. Response. Every so often we are invited to somewhere. It's always very nice to be invited. Sometimes uh, it says regrets only. I'm not sure how that really works. You don't have to reply. It's kind of good. It leaves you with an out. Regrets only. So that means I don't have to talk to anyone? Well, you do if you're not going. Okay, but I have to think about that too long. I prefer RSVP. Responde s'il vous plaît, right? In other words, this is not an option. You have to get back to the person who sent you the note. That's why they put RSVP. Now, here's the thing. 
God did not go to the extent of extending this invitation for us just to walk out the door and say, his invitation is clear, come to me. His requirements are clear, repent and believe. His warning is clear, if you do not believe, you will die in your sins. And then at the bottom of the card that he sends, it says RSVP. What's your response? The gospel writers provide us with all this information, not so that we could have a biography, not so that we could have a history, although it is both historical and biographical, but in order that we might understand that it's good news. And they present the signs or the evidence in order that we might believe, so that in believing, we might discover life in his name. That's the whole program. Well, you say, I believe. Well, then that's good. But do you believe in a kind of sitting down way? Or do you believe more in a standing up way? So here I am. If I can stand here, if I can stand here, it is reasonable to believe that I can sit there. And, and, I, and I believe that entirely. <laughs> You're all going, yeah, but okay, are you going to sit down or are you just going to stand there? <laughs> okay, then I sit down. I was right. Have you ever believed in Jesus in a sitting down way? Because some of you have taken a long time considering the record, have actually concluded that it is phenomenally relevant. But the RSVP is still out there, awaiting your response. How kind and gracious of God to give us more and more time to accept the gift that he has provided in the person of his risen Son. Father, help us to read the record, to consider its relevance, and to respond accordingly, so that we might become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May we respond standing up trust the work of Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. This is Truth For Life and a message from Alistair Begg titled, He Has Risen. For a copy of today's message on CD, simply call 1-888-588-7884, or you can download the complete sermon at no cost when you go online to truthforlife.org. Today, we'd like to send you a book about enjoying a passionate Christian walk. It doesn't feature another to-do list or a rigid set of rules. Instead, this book takes a look at the heart. It's a classic book written by John Flavel, who was a Puritan writer, and he states in his introduction, the greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God, and the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. Flavel's book goes on to describe what it means to abide with God. The title again is Keeping the Heart, How to Maintain Your Love for God, and we'd love for you to own a copy. When you contact Truth For Life and give a donation, request the book by John Flavel, Keeping the Heart. Call 1-888-588-7884 or give your gift and request the book online at truthforlife.org. I'm Bob Lapine. Glad you've joined us on this special weekend. May you know the hope we have because Jesus is risen from the dead. Hear Alistair Begg again next weekend on Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.